This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. We now look at some quantitative aspects of uh, risk analysis. Uh, how much would the loss be, and what is its probability of occurrence? Risk quantification it could be the average loss or the expected loss. We can look at the frequency of losses. We can look at the largest predictable loss. We can look at the what's called the dispersion of the risk. Uh, is it very finely dispersed so that there's very little chance of going outside a particular set of results, or is it a very wide uh, possibilities? Uh, when it comes to looking at assets, physical assets, we can look at the uh, the risk in terms of its total loss, or perhaps its repair, or perhaps its replacement, or its decrease in value. All of these are potential measures of the risk that we are experiencing. In financial assets, uh, we can look at, basically, it's going to be the loss in value. If you have money in shares, what's the, the, the minimum value it's likely to end up at, say, over a period of, of uh, a month? There are certain sorts of financial uh, transaction where the risks are actually unlimited. Uh, think of insurance. You take a relatively small premium, and if a disaster happens to one of your clients, uh, then of course the, the loss could be thousands of times what the premium actually was. And there's also a risk to your human assets. Death or injury, keep personnel can leave, they can defect to competitors and so on, uh, and there can be real problems maybe not only with the knowledge that they're taking with them, but the the more basic problems of just continuing the business without these people. This is maybe a relatively long uh, chapter uh, with a number of mathematical techniques. I'll cover them relatively briefly. They are covered in more detail in the notes. So this is just trying to, 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 to kind of orientate you. So the first uh, approach uh, which uh, we can take is to look at something called expected values. So here, uh, what we have uh, in the um, the table which has been set out, we've got two states of the world, and that the state of the world is this very general name for it could be economy one, economy two, it could be government one, it could be government two, uh, uh, it could be uh, you know the chance of war, the chance of not war, and, and and so on. Just two states of the world, and we've managed to put two probabilities on these: point six and point four. I'll repeat it later, but I'll say it now, that this must be one of the most difficult aspects to actually forecast. What's the probability uh, that uh, you know a, a certain government will, will get in? Uh, and even with uh, lots of uh, polls and opinion polls and forecasts and so on, they often get it quite, quite wrong. Uh, what's the chance of an economy improving or getting worse? Uh, and we've all sorts of analysts with a great range of opinion there. So getting these probabilities with any degree of uh, certainty almost, or reliability, must be quite difficult. And this example deals with two, two projects, or two factories, or <coughs> perhaps opening in country A, opening in country B, a project with a very general name. Uh, and if we put uh, invest in project A, uh, uh, and there are going to be identical costs of these projects, uh, then we could get 2,000 or 10,000 <coughs> with a probability of 0.6 or 0.4. <coughs> However, in uh, Project B, we're going to get 4,000 or 6,500. Again, with the probabilities of 0.6 and 0.4. And what the expected value technique does, it multiplies the probability by each of the outcomes. So 0 0.6 times 2,000 uh, is going to be 1,200. As a 0 0.4 chance of earning 10,000, so that uh, it comes out at 4,000. So you add these together, the sum of the probabilities times the outcomes gives you your expected value. On project B, it's going to be 0 0.6 times 0 0.4 gives you 2,400, or 0 0.4 times 6,500 is going to give you 2,600. 
Now the conventional treatment of these expected values is you go for the one which is higher. So here uh, people will be looking as to say, right, uh, the, the best chance, if you like, or the best combination of chance and outcomes is 5,200, we'll go for that, uh, and that beats 5,000. The problem with this technique is it's really not very applicable uh, if it is a once-off project. Uh, if this was something which is repeated every week, you know, sales in week one, sales in week two, sales in week one, week type one, sales in week type two, then the long-term averages would end up being this. But if it's a once-off project, you have once and only chance of building factory A, factory B, opening and country A, country B, uh, then it's got the big problems with it. Uh, uh, first of all, let's say that the cost that we've got in here, the cost of the project is going to be 3,800. Now, if you look at uh, project A, uh, cost of 3,800, there is a, a 0.6 chance, a better than evens chance, you're going to when you make 2,000, you're making a loss there of 1,800, which could be absolutely catastrophic for the company. If ever you look at Project B, and the cost is 3,800, we are never envisaging, even in our worst kind of scenario, of ever, ever actually making a loss. So, so one of the things that, 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 that this expected value obscures, really, is the risk. Yes, uh, the expected value is 5,200, but that hides, really, the potential, a very high potential, really, of, of making a loss in there of 1,800. Whereas the slightly lower expected value, there is no possibility, as far as we know, of making a loss. So expected values is, is actually quite bad on risk analysis. It, it, it obscures this. It kind of runs it all into one figure. Second problem, uh, really, is that the expected value is not actually expected. Nowhere in our wildest dreams if we, do we actually envisage that Project A will give us 5,200. It's either going to be 2,000 or 10,000. Similarly, Project uh, that should be saying B here. Similarly, Project B, we don't ever envisage 5,000 coming out. It's either going to be 4,000 or 6,500. So here we're making kind of decision based on figures which we know, or as far as we know, are never going to actually occur. So the three problems here. First of all, how do we actually assess the probabilities? Secondly, there's uh, this obscuring of the risk, particularly maybe the downside risk. And third, there is this whole almost philosophical problem of basing a decision on figures that we never actually expect to get. So it's, it's widely used, this uh, expected value. But as I say, the problems are assessing the probabilities. The expected value is actually often unexpected and does not actually uh, uh, reflect properly the range of risks or the range of outcomes to, to capture the risk. If we're going to be capturing the risk, we have to take into account in some way the, the spread, you know, the good, the bad, how, how, how likely are they, how far apart are they, how, how kind of dangerous are they, and so on. And this is where uh, something called the standard deviation can come in, 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 in suitable circumstances. So let's look at uh, this here, and this is this is a subject now getting on. We're calling value at risk, and think of it uh, as looking at an investment in, let's say, a share, uh, and we're looking how, from day to day, the value of that share kind of goes up slightly, down slightly, etc. Some days it'll go up a lot, some days it'll go down a lot. Every share will kind of jiggle up and down, if you like, uh, in, uh, in 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 really time, if you like, with economic uh, expectations. Now, if you have a share which is pretty stable, doesn't go up and down very much at all, this would be this, this kind of inner one here, 
a very kind of pointed, very kind of narrow. Uh, this is where you have a small standard deviation, and the, the, the standard symbol for a standard deviation is the Greek letter sigma. If, it, however, you have a share which bounces all over the place, a very kind of nervous, volatile share, then it would have a, a very large standard deviation. So the standard deviation tells us something about the, 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 the spread of the possible values of the spread of the possible results. So how is this uh, uh, used in some sorts of uh, financial uh, analysis? Uh, and this is where we got on to looking at value at risk. But before we begin looking at shares, uh, we'll take a couple of other, you know, kind of slightly simpler uh, examples, maybe, uh, which will teach us how to use what's called normal curves. So, so, so these shapes here, this sometimes called a bell-shaped curve like this, we're, we're assuming here that we're dealing with what's called normal distributions. They're all the same basic shape, but just kind of wider or narrower. Okay. And many natural phenomena like height, weight, and so on, uh, follow normal distributions. And we have to assume a lot of financial measures follow this as well. So let's take a, a kind of physical one. Let's take one with height in, in here. We've done a survey of the population. And we find that the... Uh, uh, population has a mean height, like say, let's say, of 178 centimeters. So that's the mean, half above, half below. I will say that the standard deviation, the sigma in here, is equal to three. Now, what this allows us to do uh, uh, with tables is to work out, for example, how many people are between 178. And let's say anything you like, but let's take 180. So what proportion of the population is in that height range? Now the whole population, uh, there's one, it's 100% or probability of one, the whole population. That's the whole area under the curve represents everyone. Okay. And we kind of want the fraction of one that, that these, these people here, 178 to 180. Now this is where you need to look at what's called normal curve uh, tables or normal distribution tables. And these are obviously provided in the exam. So here are, are normal distribution tables. Uh, and we've got here, they, they tell you in a way, if you look at them, what, what they're actually calculating here. Uh, we've got a Z here, and we have a Z here. And the Z here, it says, uh, it's hard to read, but it says X minus mu over sigma. Now, we're going to go back to this here. We knew the sigma was a, the, the, the standard deviation. This mean here is mu, Greek letter M or mu here. And the Z value, so this... 180 is going to be our x here. It's a distance above the mean, which will be x minus mu. In our case, it's 180 minus 178, is the two extra centimeters, as a number of standard deviations. And that's what's called the z value. Terribly important. But the tables tell you that. It says at the top of the tables, uh, at z, oops, Z equals X minus mu over sigma. It's a distance above or deep below the mean is a number of standard deviations. So we work this out for this example here. We're looking at the X of 180. The mu is 178. So that's, our, if you like, our two centimeters. Uh, and it's kind of in terms of the, the spread here, the standard deviation divided by 3, it's 0.667, or 0.67. So then what we do is you go to the normal curve tables, and you look for a z at presumably 0.67, the nearest we can get. So you go down here 
till you get to the point 6. And then the next one you go along here until you get to the point 07. So that's in here. So we line these up here, point 6 and point 07. Point 2486. And this point 2486 is the proportion of the whole population which here is between 178 and 180 centimeters. So we go from the, the tables uh, where z equals 1.67, the area or the table figure. Uh, I've forgotten what it is, I think it was 24.67, 24.86, or 24.86%, approximately 25%. So about 25% of the population is between 178 and 180 centimetres. Now, we can turn this round a little bit. So let me get rid of some of this uh, stuff uh, in in here. Uh, and what we'll do now, uh, we'll keep the same basic figures going on in here. Uh, but instead of working out the proportion of people uh, in a particular height range, we'll say how far up or down would you need to go, maybe to, to divide the population into kind of 95%, 5%. So, here we have our people, 178, that's our mu, standard deviation, 3 centimeters as before. And this should be all symmetrical, I haven't drawn it very well in, in, in here, the whole thing is completely, that's better, symmetrical. And let's say we're, we're interested in the uh, the people who are the bottom 5%. So what we want to, to, to find out really here is below what height are the shortest 5% of people. Okay. So we want to know what this x is, how far down do you have to go before you just got the 5% the of people in here. Okay. So what we have to do is kind of divide it up so we've got 50% of people up here, because half is higher, half is lower than the mean. And we must have 45% of people in there. And we must have 0 0.05 in there. So 0 0.05 is 5%. Okay. We know that the Z value is going to be mu minus x over the standard deviation. Uh, the unknown in this one is x. We know mu is the mean 178. We want to find out what the x is, what this cutoff point that splits 95% of people to the, the shortest 5% in here. And we know the sigma is going to be 3. So what we need to do is find the z-value. Uh, so this is where you go to, to the tables. And instead of going to the z-value here, that's, that's what we're trying to find, you go to what I call the body of the tables in here. And you want to find, basically this, this kind of a, a distance here that's below, you want to find the area of 0 0.45. So let's go, let's go to the tables. We want it split up so this area is 0.45. If you look at the tables, uh, it's the area from the mean up which it tells you, or from the mean down. So basically we want 0.45. So you look in what I call the body of the tables. And look in here. So we put it this 0.4495. And there is 0 0.4505, and we're more or less bang on in between these here. And if you look back here, it's 1.64, 1 1.65, 1 1.645. So the z value for 0 0.45 is 
for, if you like, the 5% cutoff is 1.645. So by the time we have gone uh, down this distribution to 1.645 sigmas, because the z value is always the distance above or below the mean as a number of standard deviations, so it's 1.645 standard deviations below the mean, uh, then we've got this 95.5% split. So you put this in here, 1.645. It's going to be 178 minus x over 3. So we turn all of this uh, around here. And we're going to have 3 times 1.645 uh, in, in, in that. Uh, we can go 178 minus that, really. It's going to be this x. So uh, we have... Uh, 178 minus 3 times 1.645 it's 173 so really by the time you go down uh, in here 5 centimeters only 5% of the population is going to be less tall than 173 centimeters. What we've got in here is 173. Because the distance below the mean of 173 be 178 minus 173, that's 5, divided by 3. So you take your 5 divided by your 3, 1.66 or, 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 or thereabouts. Uh, we, we are pretty, I mean, I've, I've rounded a little bit, obviously. Uh, uh, we, we effectively got the 5%, the 95% cutoff. So, uh, that's for height. How does it work, uh, really, in share values and, 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 and so on? Uh, what is this value at risk? Well, it's almost exactly the same. Let's say what you had was a, either a single share or portfolio of shares. doesn't really matter. Uh, and let's say that its mean value was equal to, uh, let's say, 80,000. Let's say that the standard de deviation, the sigma, uh, was dollars 5,000. The value at risk is normally measured here to this kind of 5% Uh, type of type of split, really. So what we're saying is, uh, if we uh, could lose money, could go to eighty thousand, seventy-five thousand, seventy thousand, and so on here, and, and 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 after some days, if you like, you're going to have a really bad day. It'll be lower than a certain amount, but we're we're interested in knowing this amount here. Yeah, uh, it will be. Uh, lower than a certain amount, but on only 5% of all days. So we do the same thing. So the z-value is the number of standard deviations above or below the mean. Uh, so it's going to be, the mean is 80,000. And we're going down to some value x here. And the standard deviation is 5,000. If uh, with the the z value for the the five percent level, I to call it level, I'll, I'll I'll tighten this up a little bit uh, again, is as before, one point six four five. So uh, that if you uh, that number of standard deviations out here. Uh, you have to kind of go beyond that, or at least to that, before you're in the lowest 5% of values there. So it's 1.645 in terms of standard deviation. We know the standard deviation is 5,000. So 
So 1.645 times 5,000, 8225. So this distance here, in terms of money, is 8225. There's only a 5% chance that your wealth will lose more than 8225. And the value at risk to the 95% level, there's obviously a risk you'd lose everything, or a lot more here, uh, is 8225. And this means uh, that there's only a 5% chance that after the day uh, you will have lost more than 8225. Or we're saying that the 80,000 could fall by 8,225. So 80,000, to get away, is 7,1. There's only a 5% chance that the value of the portfolio will be less than 71,775. Only a 5% chance that you'll lose more than 5,225. And this is a value at risk. Okay, this is what you're standing to lose, to only a five you know, more than that, only to a five percent chance. If we're asked to do this, not to just a ninety-five percent, but to a ninety-nine percent level uh, here, then what you do is you go down. And we want, we want just one percent in here, so if we're looking at a ninety-nine percent, you'd a not point five or a fifty percent there, a forty-five percent there, and a one percent in there, of course one percent is not point oh one. Uh so so we want only a point zero one percent chance or the point four five there. So what we, what we need to do is we want the point four five area here. So in this one here, we go back to the tables, we're looking for 0.45. So uh, uh, a big one, point, point, um, I don't know, wrong. Uh, 0.49, 49%, I beg your pardon, 49%. So 50, 49, and 1% is the way it's going to be split. So we need to look back here, uh, as close as you can get to 0.49, representing 49%. So we're about in here. That's very close to it. 0 0.4901. So it's 2.33. So the Z value, which splits up the population, or splits up your values here, 2.33. So how much is this in terms of the actual loss you might make? Can be 2.33 times the standard deviation which we're dealing with. I think it said the standard deviation was 5,000. So what this means is only a 1% chance. And you lose more than eleven six fifty in a day. Assuming the standard deviation, of course, is for the variations within a day. So this is this one percent, this five percent are called confidence levels. How sure you are, how certain you are that you won't lose any more than the value at risk. And this eleven six fifty is a value at risk really to the 99% level of certainty. One more thing to, to do on it, uh, and that is uh, looking at how do you convert valued risk for, let's say, a day, uh, to valued risk maybe for 5 days, 10 days, 30 days, if you hang on to your investment for 30 days, and of course it's wiggling up and down all over the 30 days, where is it likely to be, let's say, after 30 days here? Uh, and this is 
uh, were you just have to learn something, uh, really. Uh, we've got it written up there in one way, but I would say that a sigma for the period is going to be the sigma for the day uh, times the square root of the period. So if you're doing 30 days here, so what we had was a sigma for one day. An example we're doing was $5,000. And let's say we're looking for 30 days, what's going to happen roughly at the end of the month? Then the, the sigma for the 30 days is going to be 5,000 root 30. Or if it was 5 days, it would be 5,000 root of 5, square root of 5. Or if it was 100 days, it would be 5,000 times the square root of 100. So this, in this case, let's just this sort of work that out uh, uh, here. It's going to be uh, uh, 30 square roots, about 5.4 times 5,000. It's going to be 27386. Of course, it's going to be greater than for one day because you could have a run of bad luck. You know, lose 5,000, lose 5,000, lose, you know what I mean? Uh, but, you know, the chances are it's going to jiggle up and down a little bit. But nevertheless, there's quite a wide uh, dispersion of the risk there. So let's uh, let's then go back and say uh, what we're going to be interested in uh, in here is we're going to hang on to our investment. Our investment, I think, was at 80,000 mean. But we're going to be looking at what happens after 30 days. And we know the sigma for 30 days is 27,386. And let's go back and do it to the 5% the, the chance. So it's going to be 0 0.45 or 45%, 0 0.5 or half, or 0 0.05 in there. Okay. We know that the, uh, the, the Z for, if you like, the and 0.45. And again, you can look at it. You look in the middle of the tables. Uh, for 0.45, you can onto these as 1.645. So we know that this is, in terms of standard deviation, 1.645 sigmas. But now we translate that into real money. And here the standard deviation is 27.386. So what we're looking at here is 1.645. This distance in absolute terms, not just in terms of standard deviations, 1.645 times 27.386. So 27.386 times 1.645. It's about 45,050. This is your value at risk to the 95% confidence level for 30 days. What that means, if you hold your investment for 30 days, it's jiggling up and down, uh, there's only a 5% chance that you will lose more, or its value will be less than, uh, you know, lose more than 45,050 over the 30 days. This is quite important. It, 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 it's a nice, relatively simple, multiple choice type question to, to set. Uh, the, the biggest trick probably is this one here, remembering how to convert a daily rate into a period rate, or sometimes going the other way. Uh, so do it, it is covered well in the notes, so do have a little practice at that. Sensitivity analysis is the next one. Sensitivity analysis is looking at varying some of our assumptions to see how far they can vary or change before we break even, or before we go from a a positive NPV to a negative NPV. The problems with the method is you can only only change one variable at a time. 
And it says nothing about the chance of a particular variable changing so much that you're going to get into to, to trouble. Uh, may require some decision rules about uh, where the sensitivity is so, uh, so, so great that you prefer not to invest in this as well. But it gives you some quite good indications of where you might like to spend time and effort trying to find out more about your estimates about a particularly sensitive topic. So let's uh, look at this uh, here, where a lot of the work's been done to us. We're, we're looking at a, a, a discounted cash flow calculation. I'll just kind of talk you through it uh, here. So here we have the cost at time zero, and of course the, the discount rate is 10% the discount factor is 1. With sales, we're assuming that there's a volume of sales of 1,000, selling at a selling price of 100. And here there's 3.17 here. This is the, the 1 to 4 10% factor. You can get that from the tables which are provided. So the present value of these four flows discounted to 10%, 317,000. Similarly, the costs here, 1,000 units, the cost is only 60, so coming out at 190,000. Then we have a bit of scrap at the end, uh, coming in, uh, 17,075. Uh, and we have a net present value here of 13,875 positive, so the, the conventional wisdom would be saying, go for that. But if you think about it, this 13,875 is really rather marginal when you look at these very large figures in here. Then we have to change maybe a little bit uh, before this positive net present value becomes zero and indeed negative. Uh, and what we're always trying to do here is to get this down to zero. Okay, How far can we change an assumption before we get the NPV down to zero? Because when we get down to zero, we're going to be then a little bit more going to be changing our minds. So we'll do this with a couple of things here. Let's look at the initial cost. I think you can easily see that if this cost rose by 13,875, then this will be zero. It'll be an extra negative 13,875 there. This has simply come to zero. And the sensitivity to cost, all of these sensitivities are nearly always done uh, with respect to uh, a percentage, proportional change. The 13,875 divided by the 130,000 times 100. So 13,875 divided by 130,000. It's about 10%, 10.7%. So if your costs went up about 10, 11 percent, you're beginning to, to change your mind. Would we worry about that? Well, maybe not, because actually of all of these figures on this, this, this discounted cash flow, it's probably cost, which is the, the easiest one to actually assess. You can kind of sign a contract now. We're going to be spending money pretty soon. Uh, there are probably fewer unknowns than that than anywhere else. Let's look at the selling price, this 100. I think you can probably see if that 100 was to go down by 1%, then this will go down by 1%. There's a very direct relationship between this. This is 1,000 times 100 times 3.17. You put that down to 99, you're taking 1% off that. If this figure here was to fall by 13875, then again you'd be zero. So the sensitivity to the selling price is 13875 uh, divided by this figure here, 317,000. So you look at it as a percentage of what you're actually changing in that column. So how far could this 317,000 kind of fall there? Well, it's 13875 divided by 317,000. It's about 4.4%. .4%. Now 
Now, I would suggest that people get quite worried about that. Uh, just reducing a selling price by kind of four or five percent, something pretty pretty common maybe in terms of sales and so on. Uh, selling price that the product will actually shift at is going to be quite hard maybe to assess and so on. There might be competitor pressure coming in, which makes, makes you have to reduce your selling price and so on. So I would say, you know, this, this here is, is kind of quite a, quite a, a difficult figure to be dealing with here. I think it would be quite nice here if we get some more information about that to, to, to really see what, what are the chances of having to drop your selling price by more than 4.4%. The final one I'll do is, is his contribution. Uh, a big one, uh, a volume, not contribution, volume. If you look up here and you say, well, what, which of these figures is going to, going to be actually be affected if I change the volume? And both of these will be. Effectively, if you change the volume, you change the contribution. So if you were to reduce the volume by 50%, that would go down 50%, and that would go down 50%. So the contribution we've got in here, So 317,000 126,800 and if the contribution were to fall by 13,875 again we'd be in, in some trouble so the percentage fall that we could tolerate here is 13,875 over uh, 126,800 so 13,875 divided by 126,000 uh, is about 11% so we can sum up a much higher production in volume, much higher percentage in volume because of course when you take something of the selling price, it's pure loss. Uh, when you reduce the volume, you, you, you lose the revenue, but you also save some costs, so you expect that not to be quite as sensitive. So you can do it for, for lots of things. It's all kind of covered in, in, in the notes and so on here uh, to work out how sensitive your decisions are uh, to some of the assumptions that you're actually making. The risk-adjusted discount rate, something we'll cover in greater detail later. It's only in here to for completion, really, completeness. What it is saying is different projects have different risks. Uh, and if you're embarking on a risky project, maybe what you could do is to increase the discount rate that you're using. So an ordinary project, maybe you discount at 12%. A risky project, you maybe discount at 20%. The great thing about this is that uh, with discounted cash flow, the further off the cash flow is, the more heavily it is discounted. So if you increase your discount rate from 12% to 20%, you're really eating into this future value of the money uh, really very deeply indeed, which is just great. Because of course it's the flows in five, six, seven, eight years time, which are most at risk, which are most difficult to actually assess. So this is uh, done by increasing the discount rate for riskier projects. And we'll see later how there may be mechanisms for discovering what discount rate to actually apply to riskier projects. Next we have uh, certainty equivalent, which is where you convert your future flows into what's called a certainty equivalent here. So let's say we had a very simple little project. At time naught, we had 10,000 going out. Let's say time one, we had uh, 4,000 coming in. At time two, maybe 3,000 coming in. Time three, maybe let's go another 3,000. Time four, four, so it's only around 10, let's say 2,000. Uh, 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 maybe let's go put another one, five. So what it recognizes is that the 
these future flows, uh, there's, there's, well, they're, they're uncertain, basically. Uh, uh, the upfront one is probably certain. But we're not very sure what the, really what the year one one is going to be. We think it's going to be 4,000, but maybe to account for the little bit of uncertainty in there, maybe we multiply it by 80%. Really saying that the chance of getting four thousand in year one is equivalent to the certainty of getting three thousand two hundred in year one. Then maybe year two is a bit further off. Uh, maybe we're going to say that's not point seven five. So three thousand times point seven five two two five zero, and maybe it's going to be like fifty percent. And then we're getting really far away here. Might, we might discount it very heavily indeed here. Maybe down to 25%. And this one's here hardly, hardly worth anything because it's so far away. So all of these figures have been uh, reduced to what's called a certainly equivalent. Uh, and then what you do is you discount at what's called the risk-free rate. In other words, what we've done is we've taken the risk into account in this step here. Uh, uh, these are certain figures, as far as we know, and we discount at what's called the risk-free rate. The big difficulty is that the 0.8, the 0.75, the 0.5, the 25%, the 0.0 are completely arbitrary. There is no mechanism, no rules, regulations for deciding how far you should be discounting these future flows to account for the uncertainty. Regression analysis. Uh, regression analysis aims to predict certain things. So the X in here could be uh, the volume you're making and the Y could be the cost. So we're doing a cash flow kind of calculation. We're worried about the, the maybe the risks associated with understating or overstating the cash flows. We want to be able to predict what, what costs are going to come out if we are producing a certain volume. And we use regression analysis. This uh, purports to connect two variables, volume and cost, for example, or maybe volume sold and selling price. Uh, we just need to be certain care in this here. If you've got very few values, you've got very little evidence, there's really any connection at all between the two variables. Uh, it could be a very poor fit. What uh, the linear regression does here is you could have two kind of variables where the points are all over the place, but linear regression will determinately give you the best straight line it can through them. But obviously if you've got lots of stuff out here that's, that's kind of not accounted for very well, how much reliability can you put on believing what this line is saying? That's why you have to use what's called a coefficient of correlation to try to test how good the fit is. You need care with what's called extrapolation. So here uh, we have our maximum, let's say it is volume, let's say it is cost up here. And somebody says, well, next year we think we're going to be making this out here. Linear regression would say that you want to extrapolate in a straight line. You've no evidence of actually what happens out here. Your costs could really begin to rocket up here because of overtime costs or machinery getting inefficient. This is working hard. So extrapolation is very dangerous. You're going to a kind of unexplored territory. And finally, it doesn't prove cause and effect. Uh, let's say instead of uh, cost and volume, uh, what we had was the volume being sold here, and in here we'll put the advertising expenditure. And we see this very nice line going up like this, and the advertising manager says, look, the more I spend on advertising here, the greater the volume being sold. In fact, it might be quite unrelated. Uh, the ads might be awful, and all that's happening here is maybe the economy is improving. So as the economy is improving, the volume being sold will probably increase anyway. And almost coincidentally, 
uh, as maybe the, the profits of the company are improving as the economy improves and we spend more on advertising. So we get this what's called a spurious correlation going on. Uh, finally, uh, we have uh, what's called simulation, uh, where you try to mimic what might actually happen in practice. And the commonest one or approach is Monte Carlo simulation, where you use random numbers, hence the, the gambling or the almost roulette wheel type of idea. You use random numbers to generate a kind of typical pattern, uh, maybe of sales or people queuing or, or breakdowns and so on. So let's say that we know that uh, on any particular day, point three of all days, three out of ten days, thirty out of a hundred, uh, sales are high and the other sales are low. Now we know it's going to kind of average out, but you could of course get a, a, a bad run. You could have low day, low day, low day, low day, low day, because if the, the probability is reasonably high there. What's actually going to happen our cash flow if we get this run of bad luck and how, how, how likely is it to actually occur? It'd be quite nice to, to almost model or mimic, you know, how this, this kind of sales go up and down each day. So what you do is you take these probabilities and we're going to be using here uh, two digit random numbers. And in here, 0, 0 to, 30 to 29, you have 30. Okay. And in the other ones here, 30 to 99, uh, you have 70. So our, our numbers 00, 00 to 99 mimic or represent or uh, are equivalent to your 30% of high sales days and your 70% of low sales days. And then what you do, ideally by computer, is you generate a whole list of random numbers. So let's say the random numbers come up, and I'm just trying to make this up without thinking about it. Let's say it's going to be kind of 49. Let's say kind of 15. Let's say 7. Let's say 89. Let's say 91. Let's say 63. Let's say 42. Let's say 21, and so on. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to do this. So you say 49. Well, that falls into your 30 to 99. That's going to be a high days. A big one. It's going to be a low one. 15 falls into this range here, so the next day uh, we're getting high sales, and again a high. 89 comes into here, this means it's going to be low sales. Things will be low sales, then low sales. Well, gosh, we're getting a big run now of these low sales, uh, and eventually we get a, a high sales. You can kind of put this into your cash flow low sales, high sales, high sales, low sales, low sales, low sales, low sales, high sales. And see your actual bank account kind of going up and down, as it typically could, in much more detail than saying, you know, on average, sales are going to be some sort of expected value of your point three and your point seven.